So now we'll go through a detailed step-by-step -step illustration of DNA replication. And what I've done here is I've listed all of the enzymes and proteins that are involved in this process. All of them serve an important purpose, and so we'll go through step-by-step -step in order to see how each of them comes into play. So the first step that happens is something called DNA helicase comes. And what it does, it's a six piece protein structure. You probably don't have to remember that. But essentially what it does is it unwinds the double helix. So here we have the two strands of DNA. And the helicase comes in and it essentially separates these strands. When it does that, these two strands serve as template strands. And the process is semi-conservative. That's an important vocabulary word. And what it means is that when we build new strands, we're going to build a new strand here and we're going to, use, to build a new strand down here as well. The original DNA becomes the template strand for each of these pairs. And it's semi-conservative because each new double-stranded DNA segment contains half of the original DNA and half of the new DNA. So it's not fully conservative because you build new components, but it is semi-conservative because half of the new double-stranded DNA is the original DNA strand. So when helicase comes in, it separates the two strands, and this forms what is called a replication fork. The replication fork is obviously fork shaped like that. And what will happen is the replication will now be allowed to proceed on these strands because we have separated them and thus allowed other enzymes to have access. So helicase, it unwinds the helix essentially. It takes the helix and breaks it into its two substituent components. And those two components then serve as the template strand for the rest of the replication process. Next come single-stranded binding proteins, or SSBs. SSBs are necessary because remember that there is a strong, favorable interaction between the base pairs on one strand and the base pairs on the other strand. Remember, these are complementary to each other. And so there is an incentive for them to get back together and bind with those hydrogen bonds. So in order to prevent that from happening, we have these small tetramers called single-stranded binding proteins, SSBs. And the SSBs essentially stabilize these so that they don't end up annealing, joining back together. And that's very important. They prevent the annealing so that these two stay separate. And some of them will show up down here like this. Essentially, they just bind to each template strand, each single stranded template component. And this is important because it prevents the annealing and thus allows these two strands to be separate and allows the replication process to continue to move forward. And so SSBs are there to stabilize the strands and prevent the annealing. As the process continues, as the primase and polymerase come along, they'll simply be displaced as soon as the polymerase shows up. But these are necessary in the earlier parts in order to make sure that these two strands don't come back together after they've been separated by the helicase. So we've gotten the first two out of the way. The helicase separates the strands, and then the SSBs come in, and they maintain them in separate components so that they don't come back together and anneal or re-anneal. And then what happens is that DNA polymerase doesn't just start out of nowhere. What it needs is a primer. And a primer is a short segment of, of RNA. It's a, it's a small segment of RNA that will show up and it will be small numbers. It could be five, it could be 15 base pairs long. But essentially a primer is a short RNA component that allows the polymerase to come and bind. And so here we'll draw a primer here as well. So the primase shows up in order to produce the short RNA primer segments. And these primer segments then allow for the polymerase to come and start the replication process.
So primase creates these RNA primers, they're required to start the replication, and then the big player, which is DNA polymerase, will come along. Remember that the directionality of replication is read up and write down. And so when it's reading from the template strand, it's going to be reading in the three to five direction. So this primer here will allow replication to continue in this direction, this one, because this is the three end, and this is the five end on this strand, will allow replication to continue in that direction. So replication always starts at the three end and moves toward the five end of the template strand. The next step then is that DNA polymerase arrives. And this isn't an exactly faithful depiction of DNA polymerase, but you get the essential idea that it, it is, uh, it's something that connects to the template strand and what it will do is it will essentially move along and produce more and more DNA. And so the polymerase will move in this direction and it will add bases that are complementary to our template strand. Every time that it encounters one of these SSBs, the SSB will simply be displaced and move away. So here's our polymerase on this end and it will come along and it has a, a little attachment there. And essentially this will come along and it will continue to produce nucleotides that are complementary to the parent or template strand. And again, when it encounters the SSBs, they start to disappear. And this process will continue for a while. And uh, so it will just continue to move. Remember that it reads in the three to five direction, but the new strand will be produced in the five to three direction. So this will be the five prime end of this, and the new strand will have a three prime end over here that it will continue building toward. Whereas here, the five prime end will be first and it will continue to build toward the three prime end of the new strand. Remember that this new strand will be anti-parallel to the template strand. So what is the three prime direction of the new strand? It will be going in the five prime direction of the template strand. And so this will continue to happen and it will build on more and more bases for quite some time. And then we'll get to a point where we encounter one difficulty. And so we'll just build this up to the end or so like that. What is happening here is that as this moves along, the helicase will continue to unwind the two strands. And as it does that, what you'll notice is that it will separate. So now let's just say that our parent strand is, is getting wider. Notice that this polymerase can continue to build into the strand it will continue to produce new bases and because the unwinding is simply going to be opening up further components, this top strand can just have the polymerase continue to move and it will just be producing more bases. The issue is that this other strand, as the fork continues to open and it continues to separate these two components, notice that the polymerase is moving this way and it will expose all of these base pairs that the polymerase isn't able to encounter. And so what will happen is we'll open it up more and we'll need to build a new primer and a new polymerase will need to come in. And so we'll get into this discussion of the leading and lagging strand, but recognize that there's a strand that is leading. And what that means is that one primer is necessary and the polymerase can continue to build as the replication fork opens. The lagging strand is going to open, but notice the polymerase is building in the opposite direction. So these new ones, as it opens, will not get dealt with by this polymerase. And so this is called the lagging strand. And what it requires is it will require, again, another primase to lay down a primer and then to continue that process. And so next we'll get into a discussion of the leading and lagging strand. And that will then bring us into a discussion of RNase H, which is also known as DNA polymerase 1.
and DNA ligase. And these are pretty much only necessary for this lagging strand, strand that cannot continuously build as the replication fork opens. And so we'll discuss that, we'll draw this component, we'll redraw it so that the lagging strand becomes clearer, and then the discussion will be complete and you'll understand the replication process, how it's fairly continuous in this way, but it's discontinuous in that direction. So what we've done here is we've now advanced this replication fork. So the helicase has continued to unwind these strands and so it opens up a new region of these two template strands that can now be replicated. And so on the leading strand, it's clear that because the polymerase is moving in this direction, remember it reads from three to five, it can just continue to move in that direction into the replication fork and lay down more and more nucleotide bases. The issue emerges with the lagging strand. The lagging strand has a polymerase that's moving from the three prime end to the five prime end, but what's being opened up is further toward the three prime end than our primer is. And so what we need to do here is we will need to lay down another primer in the lagging strand. And then from that primer, we'll end up getting a new polymerase that shows up. And this polymerase will build on these bases up until it gets to the point where it meets the previous primer. This is called an Okazaki fragment. And it is something that only occurs with the lagging strand because the replication fork is opening and exposing bases from the template strand that are on the opposite side of the direction that the polymerase is going. And this is a discontinuous process, whereas the leading strand can continuously build more and more nucleotides that are complementary to the template strand as the fork opens. The lagging strand is unable to do that. And so you end up with a lot of Okazaki fragments. And this necessitates two other enzymes that we will encounter. And so the first one that we'll deal with is RNase H, or it could be called DNA polymerase 1. And the job of that is to simply remove the primer as the DNA polymerase 3 approaches this new, this old primer. And so what it will do is the RNase H will then essentially eliminate that primer. And then the polymerase, the DNA polymerase 3, will continue to move forward up until it reaches the existing part of the DNA strand. But DNA polymerase 3 by itself is incapable of joining with an already existing strand of newly made DNA. And so what that requires is when the polymerase reaches here, you now need to find a way to link the sugar phosphate backbones of this already existing DNA with the newly synthesized DNA on this lagging strand. And so you need DNA ligase. Ligase is the same root word as ligature and it essentially means to fasten or tie things together. And so you bring in a DNA ligase and what that does is it simply in an ATP dependent manner joins these two components together. And so now you're building a continuous strand based off of your template DNA strand. And this will continue to happen as the helicase keeps unwinding this DNA. What will happen is now we will need to lay down another primer and then we'll build another Okazaki fragment and it will continue to happen. So the lagging strand requires the use of RNase H and DNA ligase. And that is a consistent theme with the lagging strand. It's a very discontinuous process. The leading strand will only need uh, RNase H. Remember that's also DNA polymerase 1. It will only need it once because the polymerase 3 is just continuously laying down bases in the direction of the replication fork. So that's the big distinction between the leading strand and the lagging strand. And notice that the process of DNA replication is semi-conservative because 
we're building a new strand, but we're conserving the parent or template strand. And so it's semi-conservative. Half of this new double-stranded DNA comes from the original double-stranded DNA. There's also another word that we have to use, and this is semi-discontinuous. What that means is that the synthesis of the leading strand is continuous. It just keeps going. The polymerase can continue to move from the three to five direction. Remember that it's producing this new strand starting over here with the five prime end and going over to the three prime end here. It can continue to do this. And so it's continuous there. But the other half of it is discontinuous. It has to lay down new primer, produce an Okazaki fragment, get rid of the previous primer, and then join the newly synthesized strand with the previously synthesized one using a DNA ligase. And so that is a discontinuous process. So half of it is discontinuous and half of it is continuous. And so that means that the DNA replication is called semi-discontinuous because half of it is discontinuous and the other half is continuous. And as long as you understand that the lagging strand necessitates laying down more primer, having polymerase build more of these Okazaki fragments and eventually joining them to the other bases we've produced with a DNA ligase, then you'll be able to understand the semi-discontinuous nature of DNA replication. And remember, this is what happens when cells are dividing in, for example, mitosis. And so DNA replication is something that you use not when you're trying to move from DNA to protein, but instead when you're trying to replicate DNA. And usually that is when you're forming new cells or having cells divide and thus more DNA will be necessary. But remember the leading and lagging strand, remember the different enzymes that can be involved, and remember the semi-discontinuous nature of it, that one of them is discontinuous and the other can just continue producing new bases all the way as the replication fork opens and opens and exposes more of these template strands. Mm -hmm.